Hello and welcome everyone. I am so happy to be here today because I'm talking to you about something that I just recently discovered this semester actually and that has just really kind of blown my mind and made me think about ESL in a completely different perspective. So I'm here to talk to you today about predictable mistakes. Yes, predictable mistakes. I just thought that was so interesting whenever I even heard of the concept. And as soon as I did, I just immediately wanted to learn more about it because I don't know, it almost seemed like magic, like this was just too good to be true that you can actually predict mistakes that English language learners are going to make in their process of learning a new language. So I have learned so much about this topic and I'm so excited to be here today to be able to hopefully share this knowledge with you and give you something that you can take away from this and use in your own classroom. So we are talking about predictable mistakes, but we are specifically talking about from Spanish to English. So in the area that I live in, it's most common for English language learners to speak Spanish as their first language. So I specifically wanted to focus on Spanish to English just for the sake of this presentation, but predictable mistakes can completely vary based on what the L1 and the L2 is. So even if you're just focusing on English as being the L2, depending on the L1 of your student, they can have completely different predictable mistakes um, than Spanish. So it just depends on what their L1 is will depend on what kind of mistakes that they make. Hopefully that will make more sense later on in the video. But I just wanted to say for the sake of this video that I'm focusing on from English as an L1 or from Spanish as an L1 to English as an L2. So let's get started. So this is what the overview of everything is going to look like. So first I just want to kind of give you a general overview of an introduction and the books that I've used for this presentation and where most of my information came from. So I briefly want to talk about that. And then the second thing is inner language. So we'll, I'll explain that in a second. And the third thing is the mismatch. So the difference is from Spanish to English, like where do these things not line up in their similarities that make it difficult for students to learn English. And then the fourth is suggested practices. So hopefully you'll be able to take something away from this presentation. Even if you have students that don't have Spanish as their L1, they maybe have a different language. I hope that you can use some of these suggested practices to take away to your own classroom and use with your English language learners. So first I just want to talk to you about some books that I will be referencing throughout this presentation. So the first one is Second Language Acquisition and I have read every word of this book and I will warn you it is very dense but it's very informational. So if you're look looking to learn the fundamentals and the basics of second language acquisition this book definitely does it. But it is dense sometimes in some at some parts it was honestly a little boring to read but it was all very informational the second one is foundations for multilingual multilingualism in education from principles to practice definitely recommend this one and then the third one is applying linguistics in the classroom a sociocultural approach a sociocultural approach yeah also recommend this one as well so, let me start out by reading you this quote. In general, this is actual language use in real communicative situations and is concerned with how speakers draw on contextual cues to communicate. In addition, performance also consists of prosodic, prosodic dimensions of language use like tone, intonation, loudness, pitch, and rhythm. This can also include gestures, facial expressions, and other nonverbal acts, which make transcription quite challenging and impossible without video. So this is all about communication. So although we are talking about language today, I just wanted to take a minute to say that communication is built up of so many things. It's not just the language. It's just not reading. It's not just writing. It's so many things that build on communication. Like it says here, all of these visual things 
the nonverbal acts, all of that can lead into communication. And it's just really important to take all of those into account whenever you are instructing English language learners because all of this plays a part in them learning a language. So it's a lot more than just reading and writing. There's a lot that goes into the communication process. I also just want to take a minute to say that it takes five to seven years to learn a language. That's a long time. That is a long time. And that's the minimum, five to seven years. That's if you are really dedicated to learning this language and you're exposed to it daily, five to seven years. So just be patient with your English language learners. It takes time. It doesn't happen overnight. It doesn't happen over a few years. It takes a long time to really, truly and fluently learn a language. And even at the five to seven years, you know, that's just saying that you can communicate fairly fluently and read and write in a language. That's still not you being completely fluent in all areas of a language. So it takes time. It takes patience and it takes time. So if you are a classroom teacher or an ESL teacher in general, I just encourage you to be patient with these students and let them know that it takes time. You should know that as a teacher, but they should know that too as a learner. It takes time and it doesn't happen overnight. Okay, so now let's talk about inner language. I'm so excited. So inner language, if you've never heard of it before, is the type of language produced by second and foreign language learners who are in the process of learning a language. Inner language is neither the system of the native language nor the system of the target language, but instead falls between the two. In language learning, learner's errors are caused by several different processes. So, instead of me trying to explain this better, I just want to show you this video. So, what is interlanguage? Well, first of all, here's our second language. This is our target language as language learners. It's what we want to become. We want to become just like native speakers of the second language, or as close as possible. What's our starting point of learning a second language? Well, linguists disagree. Some people say that actually our first language is our starting point. Some people say it's actually that we start with nothing and some people say that we start with universal grammar. And in between the start and end points comes interlanguage. Now interlanguage is best seen as a language system in its own right, completely separate from the second language, which develops over a long period of time with lots of ups and downs as we get closer and closer to the second language. And there are various factors that influence the development of interlanguage. One of them is our knowledge of our first language. Another influence on the development of interlanguage is the amount of input we get from the second language, what we, what we read and what we listen to in the second language. And the third thing is what's called metalinguistic knowledge, our knowledge of languages in general. Okay, so that just did a better job that just did a much better job at explaining to you what inner language was than I could have and I think the pictures and the visuals definitely help too. So hopefully that gives you an idea of what inner language is. So there are four inner language processes. The first is simplification, next overgeneralization, Third is reconstruction, restructuring, restructuring, and the fourth is U-shaped behavior. So let's talk about each of those a little bit. Simplification reflects a process that is called upon when messages must be conveyed with little language. So for simplification over generalization, I'll give you an example of each of those in just a minute. Overgeneralization is the application of a form or rule not only to contexts where it applies, but also to other contexts where it does not apply. Restructuring is the process of self-reorganization of grammar knowledge representations. And then the fourth, that progress does not always translate into accuracy is clear in the notion of U-shaped behavior, which typically manifests itself as part of restructuring. So, to go a little bit more in detail, 
The most common ones are simplification and overgeneralization. You will see that a lot and when I explain these a little bit more, I'm sure that you will say, oh, I've definitely seen that. So simplification, an example of this would be using only one pronoun instead of gender specific pronouns. So say you used he for all of your pronouns instead of he and she. I think some languages, and I'm almost positive Mandarin, I don't know that much about Mandarin, but I believe in Mandarin, you don't use gender specific pronouns when speaking. So it can be hard for someone who has a L1 of Mandarin to learn the gender specific pronouns of English or another language when they're not used to doing that in speech. So they would want to simplify and just say he for everyone instead of trying to use he and she. So that can be an example of simplification. Overgeneralization. So an example of this would be thinking about third person pronouns. Wait. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Third person pronouns always pairing with singular verbs. So ex for an example, she sing very well. We know that's not correct, being fluent of English, but let me explain. <laughs> so it's an odd rule to learn, so it's very understandable why ELLs might make this overgeneralization. So this chart is helpful. So we see here in the first and third columns we have our subjects, in the second and fourth columns we have the verbs. So I sing, you sing, he, she sings, we sing, you all sing, they sing. So sings is the only one that is different from the rest of them and that's based on the he she subject so for overgeneralization what an English language learner might do is they understand that most of the time regardless of the subject you say sing so they may overgeneralize and say you know what I guess you say sing also even if it's he she because for five six <laughs> yeah I don't know what percentage that is but for five six of the subject you say sing singular no s so you must say sing also for he she they may overgeneralize that and use sing for the third person as well and we know English and know that's not correct but it's very common for English language learners to overgeneralize that rule So let's keep moving. So now I want to talk to you about morphological rules. Morphological, morphological rules. For the student who consistently makes mistakes in adding suffixes, say perhaps adding an S to sheep and therefore saying sheeps, is actually doing quite an impressive task applying the morphological rules consistently. So I'm sure that you have heard a child do this <laughs> at some point with some kind of word but they'll just add s or es to the end of the word word to make it plural even though it may not be morphologically correct so the example here is sheep or sheeps so we know if you have one dog it's a dog multiple dogs is dogs with an s but sheep is just one sheep or multiple sheeps with <laughs> okay wait i'm confusing myself one sheep is sheep, but even multiple is still sheep. There are many sheep. Confused myself there. So, anyways, a child may, or an English language learner, may overgeneralize and think that you just add an S to any word to make it plural when they start learning the English language. So, although this is a mistake, it's important to recognize that these learners are learning so it may be a mistake but they have just overgeneralized a rule that they have learned and think oh I can add an S to any word and make it plural so yes that's incorrect with some words but they are learning they're learning a rule and they're trying to apply it they're at least making an effort to so although they may not be able to explain that rule to you, especially if they're younger children, but when you catch them doing these things, understand that they are trying to apply these rules that they have started to learn. So that's important. So this is what I said. So if teachers look deeper into the mistakes that students are consistently making, it's easier to understand why they're making those mistakes and what they can do to help. 
Even if students are making these mistakes, at least they're trying to apply the rules that they have learned, aka they're learning. As teachers, we need to know when meaning is affected through these mistakes and when it is not. Understanding how words are inflected may help us identify deep issues in student learning. So, even if a student says sheeps, we know that's not correct, but we understand what they're trying to do. We understand that they want to let us know that there are more than one sheep. There are multiple sheep. That's what they're trying to do. So the meaning is not necessarily affected. It's just an incorrect rule. So as a teacher, just be patient with your learners as they are learning these rules. If the meaning is not heavily affected by these mistakes that they make, yes, it's important to correct them and put them on the right track of the correct English, but you don't need to overemphasize these mistakes that they are making because they're learning and they will figure it out along the way, especially being around fluent English speakers. So it's important just to maybe kind of filter of when it affects the meaning and when it doesn't affect the meaning. I should have put an example of when it does affect the meaning here, but anyways, if it doesn't affect the meaning, like if you still understand what they're trying to say, you don't need to focus so hard on that. You don't need to correct them so hard on those mistakes. Just recognize it, correct them, and understand that they are trying to learn. Oh, and if you forgot what morphemes it are, morphemes are, <laughs> then here is a little chart to remind you. So there's three major theories that I want to talk about really briefly, and these are very similar to the simplification and overgeneralization theories, but the first is one-to-one, -one, so that means one meaning to one function. So an example of this would be adding s to the end of all plural nouns. So we just talked about that with the sheep and sheeps. So definitely a very common mistake. I already explained to you what kind of mistake that is. They're just overgeneralizing. Putting an S on the end of words makes it plural. So basically the kind of mistake that they're making here, there's a theory called one-to-one -one and it means that they have figured out one meaning and they're applying it to one function. The second one is input processing theory. This is the idea that ELLs leave off ideas that are redundant or unnecessary. So I couldn't think of an example of this in English off the top of my head, but what did come to mind is an example in Spanish because I'm currently learning Spanish. So in Spanish, if you're not familiar, they have gender specific articles and also singular and plural articles. So there are four total articles. There's el, la, los, and las. All four of those words mean the word the in English. They all mean the. <laughs> but in Spanish, you have to make sure that the article agrees with the noun. So el libro. So it's the gender male or masculine, <laughs> I guess I should say. So it's the masculine gender based on the ending O. So it agrees in gender. And there's just one. So it's el then the plural would be los libros. So it agrees in plurality and then it also agrees in masculinity. That is a very quick recap if you're not familiar with Spanish. But in my opinion, being an English or being a Spanish language learner really, having English as my first language, I feel like it's redundant. I feel like there should just be one word that we use for all of the nouns because that's how it is in English. We just have the for everything. It's just the. But Spanish, there's four of them and they have to agree in gender and plurality. So, input processing theory. As an ELL, ELLs might leave off ideas that they feel are redundant or unnecessary. So, as a Spanish language learner, I don't do this. But, Maybe if I was young where I just didn't care about learning Spanish, I would say, eh, this isn't really an important rule. I'll just use L for everything. I'll just use the one word that I figured out and make it say the for all of these words. So it doesn't necessarily change the meaning in Spanish. Someone would know that I'm trying to say the word the, but it does affect the grammar. Like it's not grammar grammatically correct in Spanish, if that makes sense. So, that is the input processing theory. The third one is the emergentist, emergentist, emergentist theory. 
and that has to do with frequency and relevancy. So students who are more likely to learn words when they are used more frequently or, more, or the words are more relevant to them. So, in my opinion, that's just good teaching. So, of course, students are going to learn the words when they're used more frequently. So, if there's more vocabulary that you're trying to get them to use, then make more activities more frequently throughout the day, week, month, year. So, they become more familiar with these words. Create routines. If you want them to learn the months of the year, then talk about the months for five minutes every morning. Things like that. And then, of course, if the words are more relevant to them, if students love horses or video games, or flowers, whatever it may be, and they're giving op they're given opportunities to write about their own choice, like whatever they want to write about, then they're going to write about things that they're interested in. Hence, they will definitely make an effort to learn that vocabulary quicker because it's things that they're interested in and they want to learn those things. So that's the emergentist theory. Personally, I think it's just good teaching to include things like that. But that is how students learn certain vocabulary a lot faster than others. Okay, so now let's talk about the mismatch. What is going on between Spanish and English that's just not lining up? Something isn't matching, something's confusing. Hopefully, if you have no background in Spanish, hopefully I'll be able to explain some things to you that may give you an idea of why English language learners with an L1 of Spanish are having a hard time in some areas. I'm definitely not going to cover all of them, but hopefully I cover some major ones that will at least give you somewhat of an idea of areas that they might be struggling in. So first, I just want to talk about the role that ESL teachers play in this process. For the EL, first learning the language, agreement may take some time to learn. This does not mean that they do not understand the language, but rather that they may be unfamiliar with the structural variation needed by agreement. And I think one of the biggest takeaways has been to highlight the importance of knowing the basic of an EL's L1 to be able to understand and even predict some mistakes that they may make or struggle with that they may make or struggles that they have. <laughs> we can understand the basics of a language, for example, word order, which I'll talk about in just a second, without learning to speak the entire language. These are strategies that aid us to become more effective ESL teachers. So I'm not saying at all you need to learn their first language and learn how to speak it, learn some basic vocabulary, none of that. You can have no understanding of their L1 and still do the research to understand the basics of that language and how they may alter a lot or a little from English and where some areas might be that they might struggle because their L1 is so much different than English. So I'm focusing on Spanish here like I said, but hopefully this will give you some kind of ideas of how the mismatch may happen between an L1 and an L2. Also, I just want to say, want to quote this from one of the books that I showed to you. Anyone having grown up learning a phonics-based instruction is very well acquainted with the words, well, this is an exception to the rule. This is primarily because English writing describes much more about the language than just the phonemic inventory. Again, this is quite confusing for students learning to read, and especially students learning to read and write in English as a second language. So I just want to take a minute to say, English is hard. English is confusing. It is. It really is. But we, as if English is our first language, we don't think that. We don't think twice about it. We don't think twice at this point. If you're an adult, you probably don't think twice at this point about reading definitely speaking, writing, even listening. You maybe don't even think twice about these things. Of course, that's how it is for other L1 speakers in other languages. But for the sake of this, let's talk about English. English is hard. There are some confusing things that I've come across that I just have learned over time. But to think about how to explain it to someone is like, yeah, like this. Well, this is an exception to the rule. I don't really know why this is the way that it is, but it's an exception. <laughs> so there's so many things like that in English. It's, I did some research many moons ago, but it showed how 
often that rules that we learned in English, like, for example, I before E except after C, you know, things like that, how often those rules actually work. And the percentage was really low of how often the rules apply to everything. There's always exceptions to the rules. So just as a teacher or as specifically an ESL teacher, be aware that English is a hard and confusing language to learn. It really is. And that is definitely something that's easy to forget as you get older, you get comfortable in the language, and you don't even think twice about a lot of the ways that you communicate in English. But it is hard. And as teachers, as ESL teachers, it's so important for us to have patience with our students as they are learning a hard language as a second language. So just keep that in mind. Okay, so I mentioned about word order a second ago. So that's what I want to talk about now. So this is WALS. I guess you would say WALS, right? But it stands for the World Atlas of Language Structures. So this is an excerpt from one of the books that I mentioned. But it shows the word order of, not all, but several different languages that are pretty common throughout the world. world. So these letters all stand for subject, object, verb. So English, as we know, is subject, verb, object. He went to the store. Subject, verb, object. Spanish, thankfully, is also subject, verb, object. They have a little bit of a difference in the word order of adjectives, which I'll talk about in a minute, but the basic language structure is still subject, verb, object. So thankfully, that part is fairly easy for Spanish speakers to learn in English because the word order is the same. But because I don't want to just focus on Spanish, I just want to take the time to mention that several other languages have completely different word orders and that is really confusing if those speakers are trying to learn English. So again, this is something that you can briefly look at, understand, without even having to learn a word of the language. Just figure out what the word order is in that language. So if you have a Japanese speaker that's coming into your class, it would definitely be a good idea to address with them once they get a little farther along in the language. I mean, if they, by saying that, I mean, <laughs> if they come into your classroom and don't speak any English, after they learn a little bit of the basics, then when you start teaching them sentence structure, you definitely want to mention to them, hey, in Japanese, you have subject, object, verb, but in English, we have subject, verb, objects. So that's a little bit different, so just keep that in mind as you are learning this language. Brief things like that can make such a difference in English language learners' life, their journey of learning this language. It can make such a difference because that's not something that is ever, I mean, I don't want to say ever, but may not be explicitly taught to them. Yes, they'll learn that English is subject, verb, object, but they'll have to make the connection on their own that, oh, my first language is subject, object, verb, so I need to remember that difference whenever I'm writing in English. So if you figure out these basics about their L1 and address those with them, even just briefly, it can really make such a difference in their language learning. So, back to Spanish. Spanish is thankfully subject, verb, subject, verb, object, just like English. So we don't have to worry about that. That is something that is transferable from their L1. Okay, so like I mentioned a second ago, one word order difference is the adjectives in Spanish. It is confusing. As a Spanish language learner, it confuses me all of the time because I want to translate and write word for word in English and that's just not how it is with the adjectives. So for an example, in English we would say he bought a blue shirt. Adjective blue, noun, shirt. In Spanish you would say compro una camisa azul. I, or no I'm sorry, <laughs> he bought a shirt blue. That's word for word how it translates. But of course in Spanish, theoretically, you'd understand that as he bought a blue shirt. But in writing and speaking, the adjective blue comes after the noun. 
So that's definitely a major word order difference from Spanish to English. So again, it's just important to address these differences explicitly with your students if they have Spanish as a first language so they don't try to make this mistake in English. So if you see them writing, I mean potentially writing, you know, he bought a shirt blue, not crazy. That's how they speak in Spanish. So that's how the word order is. So that's probably what they're used to. But that being said, if this difference is not explicitly addressed, it could lead to errors like improper word order in sentences or using adjectives as noun nouns. So, you know, like I just said, it could lead to improper word order. But something that you may have not considered is they could use adjectives as nouns because they're flip-flopping the word order they might end up trying to use adjectives as nouns that's as deep as i'm going to go on <laughs> that claim but hopefully that makes sense so it's definitely important to try to address these specific differences between the languages now let's talk about the noun and adjective agreement this is also different in spanish and english so Spanish requires that the nouns and adjectives are singular or plural in agreement. So in English, if I said he bought five blue shirts, that's singular adjective, blue, but plural noun, shirts. In Spanish, that would be compro cinco camisas azules. That is plural shirts, camisas, and plural adjectives, azules. So in Spanish, the noun and the adjective have to agree in plurality. So, if they're saying, you know, he bought five blues shirts, not crazy. <laughs> That's where they've learned it from, is their first language, because their first language can definitely have an influence on their second language. So, if this difference is not explicitly addressed, it could lead to errors like adding an S to adjectives, like I just said. Okay, so now let's talk about how the subject and verb is one word. So, Spanish articles may be omitted once you become fluent in the language. For example, he bought a blue shirt. In Spanish, you would say, compro una camisa azul. But in instructional Spanish, you would say, el compro una camisa azul. So, this el, with an accent, and we talked about L a minute ago, but this L means he in Spanish. So this is literally translated as he, but without going too much in detail of Spanish, in Spanish you have to conjugate the verbs based on the subject. So the, what we call the infinitive, I believe infinitive, yeah, of the verb is comprar, which means to buy. L means he, so when you conjugate the verb comprar to say he bought, it's compro. So that is the verb comprar plus the past tense. You also have to conjugate it based on the past tense. And the subject he. All in one word. So from this one word, you learn the verb, the tense, and the subject. All in one word in Spanish. So in English, we learn the subject in one word and then the verb and the tense in a separate word. But in Spanish, it's all one. So if this difference is not explicitly addressed, it can lead to error, errors like omission of subjects. So if they're just saying, bought a blue shirt, went to the store, it's not, they're not crazy. <laughs> they don't have to specifically, in a separate word, talk about the subject in Spanish. You do learn it in instructional Spanish, like as you are learning the language, but technically fluent speakers don't really use the subject as a separate word. They just have the verb conjugated in the past tense or in the tense with the subject, and you just, as a fluent speaker, understand that all in one word. So, that's a major difference. Another one is improper prepositions. So, I just feel like it's important to mention this one because it's so similar to, to English words and based on the research that I've done, it's not uncommon for Spanish speakers to mix these words up. So, in Spanish, the word in, en, 
has several different meanings. It means in, on, at, to, into, and for. It can mean any of those things based on how you use it in the sentence. So most of the research I've done, specifically in and on, hence they look very similar to in. In and on, of course, those mean very different things in English, but they mean all of these things mean one word in Spanish. So if you see them mixing up in and on and just think, wow, that's kind of random, like these are completely different words, why would they mix these up? It's because those are really similar to the word in in Spanish, which can be used for many different functions. So you may find the L1 Spanish speakers using in more frequently or even incorrectly. The word is spelled similarly and even sounds the same as the word in in Spanish. So in and in. They sound the same, they are spelled differently, but very similar. Double negatives. This is a big one, and I've definitely seen this one before. So a native Spanish speaker may wonder why double negatives are considered incorrect in English. That's because technically they're correct in Spanish. So for example, if I say, no, no quiero una galleta, in English, that means, no, I don't want a cookie, or I do not want a cookie. So in Spanish, quiero means I want, no quiero means I do not want. So if you ever want to say, I do not something, I do not verb, then you have to put no in front of the verb. Otherwise, the verb is positive. I do want, no, I do not want. So that's how you create the difference between I want and I don't want. You have to put no in front of the verb. So, to continue, to say no, I do not want, you have to say no, no quiero. So just no quiero is I do not want. But if you want to respond first with yes or no and say no, I do not want, then you have to say no twice, no. I do not want. No, no quiero. So, that being said, technically in Spanish, they do do double negatives. Mm. But that's how the communication works in, other, in order to say, no, I do not want. So, if they're coming to English and saying, no, no, I do not want a cookie, or something, that was a bad example, but something along those lines, with the double negatives, and you say that's not proper English, they'll probably be confused because it's technically, if you trans kind of try to translate it word for word, it would technically be right in Spanish. So that's kind of where the mismatch is that may be confusing for them. So it would not be uncommon for a native Spanish speaker to use double negatives. If this occurs, simply address the misconception based on their L1. Again, if you understand these basics of Spanish, that that's how they say it in Spanish, then you can easily address that and hopefully help clear up some confusion. Also, I just wanted to mention that overall, Spanish does have a similar alphabet to English, but there are much different pronunciations. So you may look at the Spanish alphabet and be like, oh, I mean, they have a few extra letters and some double letters and, you know, some weird accents and stuff, but eh, it's pretty similar to English. Well, <laughs> not correct it's actually really different from english and although the letters are pretty similar the pronunciations are very different so if you're even the least bit familiar with spanish you will know the spanish alphabet song A, B, C, H, D, E, F, E. okay i'm not going to continue but even that will give you an idea of how different the pronunciations are for Spanish. So I just wanted to play a snippet of this video to hopefully give you an idea, even though I kind of already sung the song a little bit. Como se dice? How do you say? Okay, well. A key ingredient to both speaking and un we'll unlike the English alphabet, se, si, che, che, de, di. A, E, F, F, G, G, H, H, E, I, J, J, K, K. So you can hear some like basic similarities, but for the most part, they just pronounce them 
really different. And of course, that affects the entire language. So, I just wanted to mention, don't ever assume just because the alphabet is similar and it's written kind of similar, like they have some accents, but it's the, it's still kind of the same alphabet, yada yada. Never assume that they're similar enough to where you can try to tr bridge the gap with that because the pronunciations are very different and it, I'm sure that it is challenging for them to learn this whole new alphabet that looks the same but has completely different pronunciations. So just keep that in mind. And just to give you an idea, let me pull up this link. So this is an article that I came across and I'm not going to read it to you, but can I zoom in? Oh yeah, here we go. So common error, oh, ooh. Common errors of Spanish speakers. Oh, okay, let me zoom out. So common error, ooh. This is not working well, hold on. Okay, let's just do this. So common errors of Spanish speakers learning English. So this, oh, I have to flip the page, sorry. <laughs> this person has a list. You can see it starts here on the first page and continues to the second one. But they just have a list. They did a study and they created a list of whatever the title was, Common Errors of Spanish Speakers Learning English. Hence, pretty much what I'm talking to you about right now. So this is like seven pages, very brief, very informative if you're interested in reading it. But I just wanted to show you here on the second page, the last bit of errors that they made was really heavily focused on the alphabet and the pronunciation. So they don't pronounce the final letters of some words, they omit some words, they add different sounds, to, there's confusion between different sounds, they omit some, distorted, substituted, different sounds and letters whenever they're reading and writing. So just keep in mind that although their alphabet is similar, it's very easy for them to make several mistakes because their alphabet is so similar. In some way, it might be a little bit easier if the alphabet was completely different. So you could kind of register the two differences. But because it is similar, they actually, it kind of creates more confusion because there's such different pronunciations between the two. So let me go back. Okay, so all of that to say, I just wanted to talk to you about the differences in the alphabet. Okay. Finally, we're getting to the last section of this, and this is probably the most fun and exciting section, but this is suggested practices. So I'm, of course, not an expert, and I don't say or claim that any of these will definitely work with all of your English language learners, but I just wanted to suggest some things that have worked well for me and based on the basics of the Spanish language, I think would be very beneficial to English language learners. So me being myself a language learner from Span or from English to Spanish, and then also working with English language learners, most of them having known Spanish and then learning English, I think these that would be some best practices to hopefully try with your English language learners that may benefit them a lot in the long run. So the first one is error analysis. Let me get my laser pointer. The first one is error analysis. So a great way to see if a child's common errors are due to their L1 is to do an error analysis. So in other words, analyze their reading, writing, and speaking to see the common errors. This can help teachers identify if the child is making common errors due to L1 influence. And once you identify some common errors, you can then begin to explore the misconceptions they might have about English or their L1 influences that may be affecting their English. You can use things like oral reading fluency or ORF assessments. So if you're not familiar, familiar with error analysis, this is an example one. This is not a good one. This is one that I found for free on the internet to, just to show you kind of what they look like. So this isn't a great one, but hopefully you get the idea. But you can analyze their writing or their speaking, determine their pacing, the amount of errors that they make, things like that, their comprehension, and things like this, and just make notes, etc., etc. But if you really analyze their writing and speaking, then you can kind of start figuring out where the errors are at that they're making. 
So this may be enough for one piece or student sample, but you may have to do it a few times to kind of get an idea of where they're making the same kind of mistakes over and over. For example, like when we talked about, they're overgeneralizing and assuming that, oh, I don't know, all of the singular words can be made plural by just adding an S to the end of them. We know that's not the case in English with certain words. There are exceptions. So if we see that in their writing, they're constantly saying things like sheeps that are incorrect, then we can figure out the error and the misconception that they have and hopefully address that. So again, even if you don't know their L1, you know nothing about their first language, you can do things like an error analysis and figure out what kind of errors that they, they're making. Even if you don't want to take the time to figure out what in their first language may be causing these errors, at the very least, you can identify the errors that they're making over and over again and address those with them and be like, hey, is there anything similar to this in your first language? Maybe, maybe not, but this is the correct form in English, so we need to talk about this. So, I would highly recommend error analysis. All you really need to do this is writing and speaking samples, and you don't even have to have a fancy chart like this. You can just analyze it yourself and just highlight common errors that they're making over and over again, and then build up a list after you've collected a few samples. The second one is vocabulary, so I just wanted to read this to you really quick. One other thing that stood out to me was when bilinguals recognize or produce words, information, recognize or produce words or information, I don't know what I meant by that, encoded for both languages, not just one of the current use is initially activated. That probably made sense, I just read it wrong. The phenomenon is known as non-selectivity. What is simultaneously activated in recognition is the L1 plus L2 form representations, whereas in production, what gets simultaneously activated initially is the L1 plus L2 meaning representations. So reading this made me think of elementary ELs learning vocabulary. I think this personally would be a helpful chart for English language learners when they're learning new voc vocabulary. Again. You don't even have to know their first language. Just give them the opportunity to use it and make the connections themselves. So whatever the word is in their L1, so say their L1 is Spanish. Okay, write the word in your L1. So in English, it's apple. In Spanish, it's manzana. So let's write the word in your L1, the word in your L2, which is English, so it's going to be apple, and then draw a picture of it. So just picture here just for reference but hopefully if they have what the word means in their L1 what it means in their L2 and then a picture of it not only is that more engaging for them because they're not just writing a bunch of words that they probably don't have that much connection with in the form of definitions but instead they're writing they're drawing a picture of the word and what it looks like so they may not even necessarily need the definition because they have a picture of what it looks like and on top of that you're allowing them an opportunity to make the connection with their L1 of what that word is in their L1. So even though it may not be that clear to them what the word is in English, they at least need an opportunity to connect what it is in their L1. So that way they can make that connection. And I personally just think that this is much more engaging than just writing words and definitions in English. I've done that several times as a child, and I'm sure you probably have too. It is very boring, and I probably didn't learn very much at all from writing words and definitions. So personally, even if me not having, you know, another language, like English is my first language, even without being an English language learner, I think this is much more engaging. But with English learners having so much going on of information that they're trying to learn, I think this is a much more simple task and honestly much more engaging task for them to have their L1 word, their L2 word, and then a picture of it so they can make that connection themselves. Okay, so now I want to talk to you about etymology. I think this is so interesting and so fun and I wish that I had the opportunity to do this throughout my schooling whenever I learned new words. So first, etymology is the study of the origin of words and the way in which their meanings have changed throughout history. That's so interesting. So here, 
is an example over here, the etymology of the word etymology. So hopefully this gives you an idea of what it looks like. You go down to the root of the words and the basics, prefixes, suffixes, and break the word apart and just trace the origins of the word, where they have come from in other languages, and then how they have developed to eventually come to English. So I think etymology would help students learn and understand words so much better. So just like we discussed the history of events to understand them, we should also discuss the history and origin of words. Etymology is an important concept because it can help us see that words do not simply mean something, the same thing, every time we see it. Meaning changes because of context. Etymology is just such a fun activity and I just think it's so interesting. And I just think it would be a really fun activity to do with your English learners to, like this said, understand that words can change over time. Understand that words can mean something different just based on context. The next recommendation that I have is bilingual books. I'm sure this one is kind of a given, but I just wanted to take them a moment to really recommend this and give you some resources. So let me read this quote. However, she also noticed that often she could encourage Spanish speakers who couldn't read in Spanish but who could read in English to try reading in Spanish and they picked up how to read the Spanish orthography with ease. So. We should be encouraging our English language learners to be bilingual. We should be encouraging that because that is such a valuable skill. And I'm not going to get on my soapbox about that one, but it is. So we should be encouraging that in any way that we can. And that doesn't mean we have to teach them both languages, but we should, like this example, encourage them to learn to read and write in their first language. And that will only enhance their ability to learn in the second language because they understand the basics of their first language. So as teachers, a great way that we can help them with that without explicitly teaching them the first language in reading and writing is just to give them books. Be like, hey, I mean, not in a mean way, but just be like, hey, here you go. Figure it out yourself. Like, you know how to speak the language. You can probably pick up how to read this if you're unfamiliar with reading in your first language. So. Again, I think this just highlights the importance of always having bilingual books in your classroom library. Even if you don't have English language learners right now, you may at some point, so you need to be sure that those resources are in your library. Plus, you could have some, you know, English speakers that are interested in bilingualism and other languages, so that may be really interesting for them to read. So, although this may seem like a common sense suggestion. What I feel like, based on my experience with teachers, I feel like they know these things. For example, they know it's important to have bilingual books, but it's just kind of like, where do I start? What do I do? How do I find these? So these are three resources that I wanted to recommend to you that I think are really helpful in locating bilingual books. So the first one is from Scholastic. Bilingual books for your classroom library, K-5, I'm elementary education, so that's my focus, but K-5, here's a list, and it's from Scholastic, so more than likely, very dependable, <laughs> so it has a long list here, I mean, you can buy them, they're definitely all very affordable, and you can buy them directly on Scholastic, you don't even have to look for them on another website, so they have a pretty long list of books here, recommended to you. I'm pretty sure these are all Spanish. Did I say that already? Oh yeah, English and Spanish. Yeah, so these are all for English and Spanish. You, there's other ones if you have children that speak other languages, but this is a great list for English and Spanish. The second one is from Read Brightly. This may be a shorter, yeah. So this is just 15, but again, Spanish to English, just for the sake of that's what I've been focusing on. Um, Abuela is a really cool book. I like that one a lot. But this has, again, a list of books. You can buy them directly on this website. Uh, it doesn't show the price, so I don't know if they're more affordable. But you can definitely look. If you find a book you like, they're too expensive. You can definitely buy them on another website. I really like this book. Um, I have seen a handful of these books at Target, I will say. If you're looking to buy used books, Thrift Books is a great website. 
for used children's books. So again, this is another really great list of Spanish and English books. And I li like see here, it has Spanish and then English right below it. So it shows you the comparison. I think that's really helpful too. I really like the ones that do that. And then the last one is from the website Coloring Colorado, one of my favorite ESL websites. And they have a reading book list. I think these are also Spanish to English. I'm going to say yes because I think so. Anyways, they also have a list of books here. You can't buy them directly on the website, but well, let's click this link and see if it would take us. Nope. But, oh yeah, purchase book. Here we go. And it takes you to Amazon, and I know that everybody watching this knows how to use Amazon. So, this is another really great list of Spanish to English bilingual books to have in your classroom. And they're linked to Amazon, so I'm sure they're very affordable on Amazon. Everybody loves Amazon. So again, another really great, helpful resource for locating bilingual books, specifically Spanish and English, but it took me five to ten minutes to find these three links for you. So if you have a child that speaks another first language, I'm sure it would not take you long at all to locate bilingual books for them. And like I said, these are definitely geared towards elementary because that is my background is elementary education. But again, like I said, took me 10 minutes to find these few resources to show you. So it definitely would not take you long at all to find resources for um, older kids. There's actually one. Oh, I guess I didn't put it on here. Or maybe it's later on in here. But yeah, it might be later on in the presentation. So I'll just say, but. Like I even came across a few, I don't know if they're in this presentation or not, but I came across a few that even had the bilingual books grouped by grade level. It was like elementary, middle school, and high school. So I guess I didn't include that one, but there's tons of resources out there. Very easy to find. Okay, so now let's talk about oral communication. So I know this is a lot, I just want to read it. So much of it, oh, much in the linguistic environment, particularly in the naturalistic settings, but also in today's communicative classrooms, comes to learners in the midst of oral interaction with one or more interlockers rather than as exposure to monolo monologic, 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 monologic spoken or written discourse. This is why I think it's so important to facilitate discussions, teacher to peer and also peer to peer interactions in the classroom every single day. For elementary students, I like to provide them with sentence stems to help them get conversations flowing. For example, I agree, I disagree, I'm confused, etc. Many of these sentence stems I give them help aid things like negotiate for meeting, clarification, requests, confirmation checks, and comprehension checks. And those were all mentioned on the page of that quote I just read. Sometimes students just don't know what to say or how to explain their thinking, and I personally think that sentence stems are great modifications to aid ELLs. Personally, I have used sentence stems with just my general elementary students, and they're awesome because elementary students are still learning how to communicate respectfully with their peers and their teachers in the sense of communicating their emotions, but also respectfully. So this is great for students in general, but I really think that this is helpful for ELLs because, like I said, sometimes they just don't know what to say or how to address their thinking or how to even start to communicate to you how they're feeling. So here's an example. This is something that I created myself and I have used with my students before, and it is awesome I love this and I just made it on Google Docs so I can change it especially the last category here I can change it based on the subject that we're talking about or if we're talking about a specific story things like that I can change the questions and then just print it out for them um, but this has just been so helpful and I just love it so I call these accountable talk sentence stems so the first one is questions so can you explain more? What do you mean by that? The second one, I agree with that because. So this middle one is, I'm confused, so I'm not sure what you mean. The fourth one is disagree. So I disagree with what you said because. And then the last one is, I think your group did really well because. 
because I also use these briefly. I also use these for students to give feedback to their peers, especially when they're doing things like group presentations. I don't want to just be the only one giving them feedback all the time. They know what I think, you know. I think it's important for their peers to be able to give them feedback so they can start conversations with their peers and I can just be more of the facilitator. So these are useful for a number of reasons, but for this sp specific presentation, these are really awesome for English language learners because sometimes they just don't know how to communicate to you how they're feeling or what they want to say. So I think sentence stems are a great way to help aid them with that process. Okay, now let's talk about writing purpose. Again, I'm probably going to say this about most of this stuff, but so many of these things are just good teaching. And they're things that you should really use with all of your students, but I'm trying to keep it specific to English language learners. So let's talk about that. So let me read you this quote. Since students write for real purposes, such as composing a letter to the principal, requesting a field trip, or writing a letter to the editor of a newspaper concerning an environmental issue, they are motivated to use conventional forms to communicate more clearly. If you are giving them real purposes to write, naturally they're going to be more motivated to want to write better. If they're just writing for a topic that you give them, I mean... I'm just being honest, they're not going to be nearly as interested, whereas if you let them choose the topic themselves or you gave them a purpose for writing. So, hey, you guys want to have a pizza party? Let's write a letter to the principal and let him know why we think we should have a pizza party. You know, things like that. It's fun for them. It's relatable to them. It's real for them. It gives them meaning to want to write. So, that being said, Sometimes that's hard, especially after a few different, you know, writing topics. That's kind of hard to think of just off the dome. So, really quickly, I just want to show you these three links of real purpose writing prompts for kids. Again, this is more toward elementary, but you can easily find some for higher grades. This is a long list. I like these. If you could, writing prompts. Creative writing prompts that focus on friends. That focus, that focus on the person themselves, so how would you describe yourself, what's your favorite person in the universe, would you rather, argumentative, what would you do if, writing a story. So this has a long list, 365. This is for a full year. You've got a ton to choose from. So this alone, this is from Fractus Learning, Fractus. Um, great resource, I really like this one. The next one is from Prodigy. Yeah, Prodigy. And this has a long list. What would... What about... Oh, write about what your life would be like if you turned into a squirrel. What would you do every day? These are just fun ones. If you could add any wild animal as a pet, what would you choose and why? Write a letter convincing your parents to let you get a dog. Ooh. I wrote this letter so many times to my parents as a child. So this is definitely a relatable one that gives them purpose to write. And then maybe this is what I was thinking of with the books. But this is organized by middle school and high school writing prompts too. So this one also has ones for different grades. Maybe that was what I was thinking of with the books. I got the writing prompts mixed up. But anyways, this is the third one I want to show you. This is from Prep Scholar. This is just 57. Um, this has some tips for using these writing prompts, which I think is awesome. But then it just gives you a list of them. What's your favorite holiday or holiday tradition? That, questions like that is a great opportunity to bring culture into their writing. Let them talk about their home culture. What it's like for them. What kind of different beliefs that they may have. What kind of different traditions that they celebrate. How is it different from us? It is so interesting to know those things, and students need opportunities to talk about their culture. Again, another soapbox I won't get on, but let's continue. Describe three goals that you have for yourself. What's your dream job? These are all personal and relatable, and they help motivate the students. So these have a lot of really great ones, too. Okay. Writing purpose. Really great. 
and definitely important to consider with your English language learners. Okay, now let's talk about spelling. So, have you heard of invented spellings? Invented spellings shouldn't be seen as mistakes. These should be recognized as children being creative and putting forth effort. So, hopefully you know what I mean when I say invented spellings. It is pretty much what it sounds like. Students making up spellings for words instead of understanding or memorizing the correct spelling. So, invented spelling should not be seen as mistakes. These students are putting forth effort and being creative. So, if you are early childhood, you've probably heard this before, but for those of you that haven't, you may just see invented spellings like, oh yeah, they're trying, whatever. But they're, they're really trying and they're putting forth effort and they're being creative. And that shows that they're actually learning the language. So it's important to recognize that. However, rather than having students try to memorize correct spellings, teachers who take an acquisition view attend, attend to spelling and provide strategies and resources for their students. Yep, I think this is the best way. We should provide resources for them instead of just constantly correcting them and forcing them to memorize their correct spellings. Give them strategies and resources so they can figure out the spellings correct for themselves. So I want to show you this link. This is some spelling strategies provided by 3P Learning. So six spelling strategies that will work, plus a spelling lesson plan. So I'm not going to read all of this, but I just wanted to show you this resource because it's really awesome. So she talks about chunking, rhyming, encouraging phonetic spelling, and then teaching common spelling patterns with word family, so prefixes, suffixes, root words. Again, that leads back to the etymology activity, also a great activity to help them understand things like that. Graphemes, I hope I said that right. Spelling rule-based strategies, although I don't highly recommend those because those aren't always the case that often. Self-checking, give them a dictionary or access to the internet in a limited way so they can look up the spellings themselves and see if they're correct. But all of that to say, call me old-fashioned, but I still think that the puzzles and the crosswords and the word searches are really fun. And I'm not saying that that should be like the basis of your lesson plan, but if you have a morning activity or an early finishers activity, I maybe I'm old-fashioned, but I think those are really fun. And I remember doing those in school, and I looked forward to them because I wasn't thinking about reading, writing, or spelling. Like, I was just essentially playing a game. So I really like those, too. And... I forgot about this thing. What is this one? Oh, again, just wanted to show you this resource. Top 10 resources on spelling and word study. I'm not going to go through all these. This is from Reading Rockets. It's an awesome resource. And if you just click on these links, it takes you to even more articles and just gives you some ideas for teaching spelling in the classroom in more creative ways. Okay. Now, based on spelling, I want to talk to you about spelling investigations. So, a spelling investigation requires a student or group of students to inquire a spelling pattern sound or observation about how words are spelled and then to find and sort examples of this and create generalizations about spelling based on the evidence found. These are really cool and I just learned about these this semester and I just think this is such a good idea especially if you build it up and tell them it's an investigation, it's a mystery. I think this would be so fun for them to research the spelling on their own and maybe research the etymology on their own research the pattern on their own where does this apply to other words things like that this would be such a fun activity for english language learners and it goes in much more depth than just giving them spelling tests and forcing them to memorize words that they have no meaning connection to and they're just forced to memorize it's not going to cut it we have to do things in a deeper, more meaningful way, and this is a great way. 
So, to continue, I think spelling investigations are a great, great way to have students take control of their own learning. This activity can help spark questions and conversations for more in-depth learning to take place. So, they may investigate something and understand that's a rule, and then they're like, teacher, why? Why is this a rule? Where else does this apply? And that can lead to conversations that allow them to learn even deeper. When students investigate spellings, not only do they become better spellers, they also learn the skills of science and begin to approach the study of language the way linguists do. That's what they should do. They should approach the language in this way. And aside from that, it's so much more engaging for them and they will learn so much deeper because of it. I just want to show you this link really quick. This was, I think, on a teacher blog. Yeah, and it is a spelling investigation in action. So I'm not going to read through all this, but she just basically gives you her lesson and how she uses spelling investigations. So this is a very in-depth lesson compared to just my brief overview of what a spelling investigation is. If you want to look it up, it's Miss Fentelman. Fentelman. And it's a spelling investigation in action. So if you need an example lesson plan and want to learn a little bit more deeper about what they may look like in the classroom, then I definitely recommend this. Okay, so now let's talk about cognates. So first, if you're not familiar, cognates are words in two languages that share similar meaning, spelling, and pronunciation. 30 to 40% of all words in English have a related word in Spanish. So if you have students that have Spanish as an L1, congratulations! Spanish is really similar to English in a lot of ways. There are many cognates, although the alphabet and the pronunciation is a whole lot different. Thankfully, there are cognates to help students learn the language, and this is definitely a lot different if students had a different L1 other than Spanish. So thankfully, Spanish is very similar to English in that sense. So when applied, the use of cognates can positively affect literacy development. So yes, they will learn cognates on their own, but they will it will be so much better for them if you give it to them explicitly and help them make that connection. So Coleraine, Colorado is a wonderful website and they have an amazing list of Spanish to English cognates. This is a little snippet of it. It's what it looks like. Oh, by the way, mm, I'll do this first. Where I got this definition here was Coleraine, Colorado website here. And this article is using cognates to develop comprehension in English. So they go into a whole lot more detail about how cognates, oh, that's common, how cognates affect the learning in English. So if you want to learn a little bit more about that, I highly recommend this article. But aside from that, they provide a free list of Spanish to English cognates. Thank you, thank you. This is an awesome list. It's five pages in alphabetical order. So just to give you an example, accident in English is accidente in Spanish. Very similar spellings, very similar pronunciations. So making those connections of words that are similar in English and Spanish helps them learn the language a lot qu quicker because it's easier for them to remember because it's similar in their first language, naturally of course. One other thing I did want to mention is on this website, is it, uh, maybe, Oh, here they are. The, there are some false cognates. So it's definitely important to address that. For example, globe in English is globo in Spanish, which means balloon. I mean, similar concepts. I mean, they're both round, I guess. <laughs> but there are a few false cognates that they mention on this article that may be important to address with your Spanish speakers. Pie in English is pie in Spanish, which means foot. <laughs> rope in English is ropa. In there, or there is ropa in Spanish, which means clothes. Soap 
in English, there is sopa in Spanish, which means soup or pasta. Large in English, there is largo in Spanish, which means long, a little bit different than large. Exit in English, there is éxito in Spanish, which means success, so also a little bit different. Hey in Spanish, there is hi in, or hey in English, there is hey or hi, I think it's hey. Now my brain's all, which means there is in Spanish, and that is a very popular word. So definitely recommend addressing these false cognates with them so they're not confused and don't try to overgeneralize the concept of cognates. But, like I said, this article addresses some of those bigger ones, and I think it'd be very important to talk about those things with your Spanish speakers. Okay, I believe this is my last suggested practice, and I left this for last because this one's a little bit more complex, and I don't highly recommend it as much as the other ones, just because it is a little bit more complex and it's a little bit more time consuming. And as teachers, we are busy and we don't have any free time. So I don't recommend this one a whole lot, but I just wanted to mention it. So by using the phonemic chart for that language, the teacher was able to predict where some language issues may arise in learning English and to write about how this analysis helped them understand the student. So if you're not familiar with the phonemic chart, this is, gives you an idea of what it looks like. I don't think this is the full chart. Maybe it is, but I, I don't think this is. Anyways, there's a lot to learn about the phonemic chart and the symbols and the pronunciations. And I, some of it is still kind of confusing to me, so I'm not going to go in that depth of detail. But basically, all languages can be translated to the phonemic chart to allow you to basically read what the person is pronouncing like. Okay, so just take that in. So to do that, there is this free website you can do. The only thing I don't like, it's hard to find voice to phonetics. I don't really think I've found like a free website where you can speak into it and then it does it into phonetics. It's more so just text to phonetics, but we all know five people can pronounce one word five different ways, you know what I mean? So this isn't the best resource. Again, this is why I left it for last, not of my highest recommendations, but nonetheless, if you wanted to look into this a little bit deeper, it, well, let me just show an example, I guess, to give you a better idea. So you type in words and then it spits it out in this weird looking language. That is the phonetic alphabet and when you learn to read the phonetic alphabet you can understand, you don't have to know what language it is, you can just understand what the pronunciation sounds like. So regardless of the language you can understand what the pronunciation, well this one's specifically to English, but it can be used for all languages to understand the pronunciation. And that being said, when you look deeper at students speaking and what they are pronounce, pronouncing each sound like, then you can help more specifically identify areas that they are struggling with and certain pronunciations that they are struggling with. Like I said, that one's really specific and probably very time consuming and I don't have the best resources for this. but. This is something that I've recently learned about, and when I did do an analysis, it was helpful to identify the specific sounds of differences that students were making as they were English language learners. Basically, what I did, since I haven't been able to find like a speech to sound phonemic chart resource, I basically just typed the words, as incorrect as they were, how they sounded to me in English and then put them in the translator and then looked at how they're sounding out words. Just because there's not a speech to phonemic chart or phonemic, yeah, phonemic alphabet I guess. Um, translator, that was just the easiest way. I'm done talking about this because it's not the best of recommendations, but I did want to include it. Okay. So let's wrap this up because this has been long. 
Why is this important? The previous language programs, this is an example from one of the books, the previous language programs she had been a student had been through did not place consideration on the phonological differences between the languages, but rather just assumed that over time Maria would spontaneously learn English, and if it didn't happen on time schedule, it must be a learning disability. Oof, okay. Hopefully this presentation has showed you why it is so important to consider an English language learner's first language when considering their English learning. Their first language can have a huge impact on their English learning. English is hard to learn. English takes at minimum five to seven years to learn. At the bare minimum. Bare minimum. All of these things in consideration we don't want this to happen to our students. This affects their whole life. We don't want them to be diagnosed with a learning disability when it's truly just a language barrier. That's the worst that we can do for a student. You may think that you're helping the student because, oh, well, if I diagnose them, then they'll get extra services and this and that. Mm, you're wrongly diagnosing a student that really just has a language barrier and is probably on grade level, if not above grade level, with their learning there's just that language barrier there. So they don't need special education resources, they need more ESL resources to help them overcome that language barrier that they are facing. So that is why all of this is so important. I just want to end with this quote because it just spoke to me in a special way. There's no limit to the number of sentences that can be spoken because every sentence is new and every sentence follows the rules generated in the mind. There are an endless amount of words and sentences, well, I don't want to say words, words and sentences, I guess, <laughs> that we can combine to create communication, language, reading, writing, speaking. It's endless. Our students have so many opportunities and that is so exciting. So, although your English learners may be feeling discouraged at times, that's what you are for as the teacher, as the ESL teacher, to encourage them that there are an endless amount of opportunities to discover, to be able to create language, and not to get discouraged. Just because they may be making a few grammatical mistakes frequently, they shouldn't get discouraged because there's endless possibilities for communicating in a language. That is all I have today. I so hope that you have taken something away from this, that you're able to use in their, your classroom with your English learners. It is even more exciting if you have students that have an L1 of Spanish because a lot of these were very specific from Spanish to English. I apologize if not, hopefully you're able to take away some practices even if you have students that don't have an L1 of Spanish but have an L1 of a different language. And hopefully use some of these practices just with your English language learners in general. Hopefully after this presentation you understand why I had to specifically focus on Spanish to English because it can vary a whole lot if they have a different first language or the target language is different than English. So hopefully that makes sense. But nonetheless, I hope that you're able to take something away with this to apply to your English learners in your classroom and apply to your own teaching. Here are all my references. The three books that I mentioned at the beginning are within these references. All of the websites that I showed you are in here too. That is all I have for you today. Thank you so much for watching and listening. Bye.